Raring to go again. Let's remember where we were. At the end of the last lecture, what we derived was the action for a spinner field. And we really derived this. Remember, we, what we did was we looked for representations of the Lorentz group. We found a new representation, the spinner representation. We introduced a field. This is a four-index complex object called a Dirac spinner. Um, and this was defined such that it transformed in this particular way under the Lorentz transformation. And then we worked quite hard to figure out how we could write down a real action which was Lorentz invariant. Okay. And this is what we, what we came up with. Yeah. Before we had treated the um, field in its complex constant as independent variables in a lot of contexts, mm -hmm. do we treat the field in its direct constant? A absolutely. Although it, it doesn't... It doesn't matter in that context, because if you treat the field in the Dirac conjugate or the complex conjugate as, as independent, it, it's just going to be an extra, an overall gamma zero that, that's appearing in the equations of motion. But gamma zero squared is invertible, so you can always just divide oh. by it. So you can do either. Yeah. So for example, if we want the equation of motion, we, we can work out the equation of motion for psi bar, that's easy. You just cross off psi bar and it's this equals, equals zero. That's the Dirac equation. Okay. So a few things to note. It's, it's first order in derivatives rather than second order. That's kind of what's miraculous about it. The, the I here is just to make sure the whole thing is real. It's because if you integrate by parts, you pick up a minus sign, but, but then you want sort of the complex conjugate to... Uh, it's the same reason that the Hermitian operator in quantum mechanics is, is, is minus i times a derivative. Make sure the whole thing is real. Um, the other thing to notice is it it's, depends on m, not m squared. So m is again going to be the mass of the particle after we quantize. But notice that m here can actually be positive or negative. There's no requirement on the sign of this. So we'll find that after we quantize, it, it's the modulus of m that turns out to be the the mass of the particle, okay? But, but M can take either sign here. Okay, any questions? There's some cute notation that, that, uh, that Feynman introduced. Uh, anytime we have a vector, so any vector at all, a mu, and you contract it with the gamma matrices, so that what you end up with is a four by four matrix. You put, a, you put a slash through it. So it's just some cute notation to stop you writing lots of gamma matrices everywhere. Okay. So this is a vector, just a normal vector. This is um, uh, the set of four 4x4 four four gamma matrices. And so this is then a 4x4 four four matrix, but a particular 4x4. Four four. So in particular, the Dirac equation in this notation This is d mu gamma mu. Okay, so what I want to do today is tell you a few more properties about these Dirac spinners uh, and the Dirac equation in general, um, and then maybe at the end of the day get on to quantizing the Dirac equation, but that may take until tomorrow. So we'll see. Uh, are there any questions about? What we did before. Yeah, please. No, 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 no implications of that at all. I, I think, you know, you, you could have just as well written a twiddle or anything else, but, you know, Feynman wanted a quick way to write this, and, and this is what he came up with. Um, it's, it's actually a bit annoying. Feynman didn't anticipate LaTeX, but in LaTeX, when you put this slash through something, it never quite sits where, where you want it to. So you have to spend ages moving the, the, the letter underneath a little bit to the right and a little bit up, just, just so it looks good. Is that right? OK. Oh, I didn't know that. I, but, but to get this D slash in my lecture notes took me at least a morning, I think, to, 
figure out how to get that partial derivative under the slash. Um, okay, other, other questions? Okay, so I want to tell you about um, something called chiral spinners. And remember that for our particular choice of the gamma matrices, which we call the chiral representation. It's not the only choice, but it, it's the choice that we were playing with. When we worked out the Lorentz transformations that come from these, uh, these gamma matrices, we found the following. So I think we got this in the last lecture. This is for rotations. And this was for boosts. Okay, so you, you guys remember this? The, these, these were the, the things you act of psi with on the matrix indices of psi. So these are four by four matrices. We wrote them as, as the exponentiation of some infinitesimal generators. So these were e to the, there was no i because the generators were anti-emission, but they were e to the, the something times s mu nu, and the s mu nu's were the, were the commutators of two gammas. Okay, so we run through this calculation of psi there. On Friday, what I wanted to point out to you was that there's no factor of i here, which means that these guys aren't Hermitian, sorry, these guys aren't unitary, um, which in turn forced us to sort of define this new Dirac conjugate and jump through some hoops and put a gamma zero in the action. Okay, you remember, remember this? Th this time I want to stress something else. The, these have come out to be block diagonal, okay? And what that means is that we haven't found what's called an irreducible representation of the Lorentz group. We haven't found the smallest kind of representation possible because if I just considered the two by two spinner here instead of the full, sorry, not the two by two, the, the two spinner instead of the full four spinner, if I act on that two spinner with either boosts or rotations, it doesn't mix into the other guy. It just stays amongst it. So what that means is that this block and this block must themselves be a representation of the Lorentz group. And similarly, this block and this block. So this is block diagonal. So this is a reducible representation Lorentz group. And it decomposes into two irreducible representations. So if we take our full spin of psi and write it in terms of two two spinners. So this has two components and this has each a two component spinner.
And these have a name. These are called vial spinners. Eric, yeah. Did you say that, that the, these gammas were the chiral representation and that they, it was irreducible? Yeah, so, so the gammas are an irreducible representation of the Clifford algebra. Okay, gamma mu, gamma mu equals Minkowski. But from the gammas, we then constructed a representation of the Lorentz group, and it turned out it was an irreducible representation, sorry, it was a reducible representation of the Lorentz group. Okay, so this big guy is called a Dirac spinner, these little two component objects, they're still complex, they're called vial spinners. They're sometimes called chiral spinners as well. So, under rotations, well, we just read off from here, you can see that there's the same plus sign, so they both transform the same way under rotations. By the way, this, this is a three vector of numbers here, which is just saying you know, rotate 16 degrees around the, the z axis. Okay, but under boosts, they pick up a minus sign. Okay, so if people know a lot of group theory, the, the U plus is sometimes called the half comma zero representation of the Lorentz group, the U minus is sometimes called the zero comma. Okay, good. So this Dirac spinner contains sort of constituent objects. U plus and U minus. Uh, we can look at the Dirac action. Okay, so this is the Dirac Lagrangian. If we write this out in terms of the U's, This is psi bar, okay? This is psi dagger, and psi bar is psi dagger times a gamma zero. So this is gamma zero. Okay. Um. Okay, this is the Dirac operator d slash written out in full. It's derivatives d0. Maybe I should put d0 there instead of dt. d0 and the spatial derivatives di multiplying the gamma matrix. Okay. And then there's a minus m u plus u minus. Okay, so just writing this out and introducing a little bit of new notation. where I've introduced a new notation which looks like the Pauli matrices except now it's got a, uh, a space-time mu index on instead of the i. And so this is a, a set of four two-by-two two vectors, two-by-two matrices. The first one is just the unit matrix. 
and the others are just the Pauli matrices. And this guy U bar here, <coughs> the first one is the unit matrix and the rest are minus the Pauli matrices. This is not the Hermitian conjugate of, of sigma. Okay, it's just some new notation that I've introduced. And it means this. Is there a 4 by 4 matrix attached to M? Attached? Yes, it comes with the unit 4 by 4 matrix. So wherever there's an M in the Dirac equation, that's always implicit. And in this, in this equation, it's not needed because this vector just contracts with this vector through this matrix. It's always. why the Dirac equation is something that's a little more useful than, at least at first sight, than the vial. Or the Dirac spinners are more useful than the vial spinners. It, it's because the vial spinners are two by two objects. They have their kinetic terms that, that sort of is a kinetic term for U minus and a kinetic term for U plus. But then if you want to add a mass, the mass necessarily uh, couples U plus, U plus dagger to U minus. So so for massive fermions we need both u plus and u minus because they couple together but if you have a massless fermion that can be described by just a single vial spinner instead of two vial spinners By the way, I've, I guess the language here is anticipating what we're going to see, which is that when we quantize these spinner fields, we, we're going to get fermions. So I'm just using this language here. Okay, so if we have a massless spinner field that will give rise to a massless fermion, we can describe it, or, or such an object can be described by just a single vial spinner instead of a pair of vial spinners. A single vi vial spinner obeys the following equation. This is the equation of motion that comes from this action when m is zero. And you get it just by crossing off this. There's a similar one for U minus if you chose to describe a spinner by U minus. Okay? Okay. So just derivative equals zero, no mass. Okay, so if we have a massive particle, it has to be described by a Dirac spinner. If there's a massless particle, the Dirac spinner decomposes into two objects, U plus and U minus, uh, which don't talk to each other, at least at this free level. Um, and so it may be that there are particles in nature which are just described by one of these objects and not, not, by, not by the other. Uh, I have a question for you guys. Who knows any particles in nature that are described by vial spinners of this type? Neutrinos. Neutrinos. Good. Does anybody know of any others? But neutrinos are masses. They're not. No. Does anybody know of any others? Every particle in the standard model is described by vial spinners of this type instead of Dirac spinners. 
And as you pointed out, the neutrinos aren't massless, and neither is, is anything else. So what's going on? Well, all of the particles in the Lagrangian we write down in the standard model are massless. There's never any mass terms of this type here. They get their mass through another mechanism called the Higgs mechanism. And you'll learn about this you know, maybe in the next course, maybe in Michael Peskin's standard model course. Um, but in particular, because of the weak force, all, all the fermions in the standard model have to be described by, by vial spinners or chiral spinners. Uh, and they, they come in pairs for all the fermions. So there's a, psi, a, a U plus for a fermion and a U minus for a fermion, but those have different, different properties, the U plus and the U minus. So they can't be combined together into a direct spin. Okay. And you'll learn about this uh, later. But everything is massless in the standard model. Yeah. How do we interpret this U plus and U minus? And then, uh, yeah, how do we interpret this U plus and U minus? And I know we're going to talk about Yeah, I wasn't actually going to talk about it. Okay. Um, so there's two here, I guess, since they're massless. But yeah, what, what's going on here physically? So physically, what, what, what's going on? We're, it's probably best to describe it in terms of particles instead of fields. So when we come to quantize these objects, we'll find that the particles we're getting have extra internal degrees of freedom. That we'll interpret in terms of spin, and that you know, they'll be spin up and, and spin down for certain particles, and there'll be particles and, and antiparticles. Yeah, we're, we're actually going to quantize the side. We're going to quantize massive guys, quantize the from side. This fact that it's two plus and minus that are important will, will be fleshed out in our process. But we're, we're, we'll quantize the side. We'll find that it's complex. It gives rise to a particle and an antiparticle. And each of those particles has its spin half, which means that it can be spin up and spin down. And that's what it so that, that, that's sort of the physical interpretation of what this section index is telling you. Other questions? Okay, a little bit more Dirac-ology. Um, I'm going to tell you about gamma 5. Okay, so, so, so what, what's, what's the right way to, to, to phrase this? Here we wrote down that, that psi was just u plus and u minus. Two components at the top, two components at the bottom. But if you trace back why that was sensible, it was sensible because our particular choice of gamma matrices, that, that chiral representation, which then gave rise to that particular choice of Lorentz transformations that was block diagonal, so it made sense to have u plus at the top and u minus at the bottom. Okay. But if for some reason I want to work with a, a different set of gamma matrices, my Lorentz transformations are not going to be block diagonal, and everything's kind of all going to be mixed up. So there's still lurking inside there two two spinners, u plus and u minus, but they don't just sit naturally up here and naturally down there. They're all sort of mixed in some complicated way within this four, four vector. Okay? So what I want to do now is just explain to you how you think about these vial spinners in any arbitrary gamma matrix basis. Okay? And we'll introduce this thing called gamma phi. So we introduce a fifth gamma matrix. And we get this just by taking all the four gamma matrices and multiplying them together. Okay. Dead easy. So you can convince yourself that this has certain properties. Uh, firstly, it anti-commutes with 
the first four gamma matrices that we came up with. And secondly, it squares to one. Okay, so it really is the, sorry, I missed a five there. Gamma five squared equals one. Okay, so, so you, you can check, check both of these just on the, the definitions of the other gamma matrices. You don't have to plug in explicit gamma matrices here, but just the fact they obey the Clifford algebra guarantees that, that this is true. Okay. So, so it's a fifth gamma matrix. We call it gamma five. You might think gamma four is, is sort of more sensible given that the others are gamma zero, one, two, three, um, but everybody calls it gamma five. Okay. But what, one reason is that often we want to work in Euclidean space where the mu label goes from one to four instead of zero to three. And, and so there it makes sense to call it gamma five. It just sticks. Okay, okay so... What, what, what to say here? G given four gamma matrices, we get a fifth for free. It, it's clear that now gamma five and the gamma mu's satisfy a Clifford algebra that's in five dimensions instead of, instead of four dimensions. Okay. Gamma five anti-commutes with everything else and squares, squares to one. Th this, this is something that holds in all even dimensions. So if you take that Clifford algebra, you try to figure out gamma matrices that obey it in any dimension. If the dimension you're in is even, you can always just multiply all your gamma matrices together and uh, pick up an extra gamma matrix that obeys the Clifford algebra in one dimension higher. Okay. Okay, now the crucial point is that is that in, back in four dimensions, this guy squares to one. So since gamma five squared equals one, we can define a projection operator This is a Lorentz invariant way to, um, to describe a projection onto a four component Dirac spin. Okay. So, in particular, once we've got a projection operator, there's two projection operators, P plus and P minus. Each of them projects onto half the, uh, the vector space spanned by its side. So we define chiral spinners. As just taking a usual Dirac spinner and hitting it with this projection matrix, P plus minus. Okay. It's going to project out half the degrees of freedom of this. You're left with something that's, that's psi plus minus. And this guy here is the analogous thing to the vial spinners, U plus minus, but in an arbitrary basis. Okay. In particular, if you went through this procedure in the chiral representation and figured out what these parts psi plus minus were, you would find in the chiral representation, you would find uh, psi plus is u plus zero and psi minus is zero u minus. Okay, is this, this clear? Yeah. 
So one reason to tell you all this is, you know, in the last lecture, I worked very hard to try and come up with, uh, with objects which were scalars under the Lorentz group. So you start with psi, which is a spinner, and you want to construct something that's a scalar. And we learned that the thing to do is to do psi bar psi. Psi dagger psi didn't do it, but psi bar psi did. Well, we've got this new matrix gamma 5, and you can show the psi bar gamma 5 psi is a Lorentz scalar. Actually, there's an extra word you should add here, which is pseudo scalar. I'll explain this in a minute. Is a Lorentz vector, and I think it's called the same thing, a pseudo vector, axial vector, that's it. Okay, so we have a spinner field. We want to start writing down Lagrangians, which describe interactions, perhaps with other fields. Uh, what we have to play with are basically the, the sensible objects we can construct out of psi. So we can construct psi bar psi, but we can also put a gamma 5 in between there. And that's also something else we can write down in a Lagrangian. Okay. And the same for, for this vector in charge. Um, these words pseudo, I'm not going to describe to you in detail what these mean because I think Michael Peskin's going to do it in, in the standard model course. Uh, if he doesn't, you should bug him and make him. Um, it's, it's all in the notes if people want to read it before time. Um, but this basically means how these things transform under parity. So there's this extra discrete symmetry which your theory may or may not have, which is basically what happens if, if you flip the theory and look at it in a mirror. And you can show that, that this picks up a minus sign under that and this also picks up a minus sign under that. So that's what this pseudo and, and axial mean here. So in general, if you see a Lagrangian with a gamma 5 sitting in there, that's an example of a theory that looks different uh, in the mirror than it does not in the mirror. Okay. So this is just sort of giving you a nod for things that will come up in the standard model. Any questions about, about this? I'm flying through kind of quick and just giving you the basics. Eric, yeah. Yeah. How come the, the projection, how do the projection operators do this? How do it work? Did, did they give this? Yeah. Yeah, you, for that particular case, you actually have to figure out what gamma phi, what this is. Well, if you plug in the, the specific gamma matrices in the chiral representation, what you get is that equal to this. This is a 2 by 2 unit matrix. Here again. So the way you form the projection operator, the projection was the top bit or the, or the bottom bit. U plus U minus. I may have missed a minus. I don't want to go right. OK, other questions? So, so there's this whole story about sort of substructure within the Dirac equation. There's something else called Majorana spinners, which is a way to make the Dirac spinner, which is four components, real instead of complex. Um, again, there's a uh, page in the notes about it. Um, you may or may not come across this in the standard model course. Um, but I, I just want to move on. I, I don't really want to dwell on this. What we're going to do when we come to quantize is just consider the Dirac spinner. We won't be thinking about these these vial spinners at all. Okay. Questions? Okay, let's look at the symmetries of the Dirac equation. Okay, so there's a bunch of, uh, of symmetries that this Lagrangian has. Uh, the first two are the ones that we've seen already for the scalar field. 
it's the fact that it's invariant under space-time translations and also invariant under six Lorentz transformations. So each of those is going to give rise to, uh, to a conserved current or a bunch of conserved currents uh, for this, this Lagrangian. So instead of deriving them, and if you want, you can sit down and, and do them. You know, it's the same sort of techniques we were thinking about in the first week. I'll, I'll just tell you what they are. So translations, we get the stress energy tensor. And it's equal to the following. Okay, so this is just applying Noether's theorem for this particular symmetry to this Lagrangian. For Lorentz transformations, th there is something kind of interesting, a new, a new subtlety that comes out here. Um, see, under, under a Lorentz transformation, psi alpha does the following. So we've already seen for a scalar field, we have transformations like this, the, 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 uh, that is just a transformation of space. And that gave rise to a conserved current that was angular momentum and this kind of weird thing for, for boosts. So the, the set of currents Okay, so I'm going to use this notation that we've, that we've come across before. This is the current, and this labels which particular Lorentz transformation we're doing that gives rise to this, this conserved current. And so these are anti-symmetric in rho and sigma. And it's equal to this, x times the stress energy tensor. Which is the same thing we saw for the scalar field. But there's an extra term. And I've lost the extra term. Oh, it's here. Okay. And we pick up an extra term precisely because we were doing an extra thing when we did a Lorentz transformation. So, so this bit here contributes this to, to the conserved current. Okay, th this is important for the following reason. When we quantized the scalar field, I said that you know, to understand what we call the spin of the scalar field, it, it's nothing more than, than how things change under, under rotations. So in that case, what you do is you, you compute the conserved quantity due to rotations. That looks something like this. You then turn that into an operator, and you act with that operator on the state that corresponds to a stationary particle sitting here. And it gave zero. Okay. We'll do exactly the same thing here when we quantize. We'll quantize the, the, the Fermi field. We'll act with this uh, operator on a single particle state that isn't moving, but we'll find it gives a half. And it gives a half because of this term here. So th this term here is what's telling us that these particles are spin half after we quantize. Uh, yeah, please. We never observed anything in the scalar. No, the scalar didn't have this just transformed here. So if you like, this transformation is given these two terms, and it's, it's this extra bit which is given here. There is a similar term if we consider vector. They also transform. Other questions? Okay, um, there's a couple of internal symmetries. So one is just the fact that psi is complex. We can change the phase of psi. This action doesn't change. 
Okay. This doesn't depend on space. This is just an overall constant change of uh, psi. This has a current associated to it, sometimes called the vector current, for a reason I'll describe shortly. So there's a V for vector. And it's just equal to psi bar gamma mu psi. Okay. There's a conserved quantity associated to this. You take J0, you integrate it over all of space. That's the conserved quantity that's going to tell us uh, particle number for fermions. Number of particles minus number of antiparticles. It'll also be electric charge and things like this when we come to introduce electric charge. And finally, there's one extra symmetry which maybe isn't obvious. Uh, if the mass is equal to zero, so this term isn't here, then, you know, we already saw we expanded this action out in terms of u plus and u minus. And if the mass isn't zero, sorry, if the mass is zero, then there's nothing coupling u plus to u minus which means I could change the phase of u plus by something and change the phase of u minus by something else, and that's still a symmetry. Okay, that's only true if, if m is zero. So you can check there's a nice way of writing this in terms of this gamma five matrix. Um, Okay, so what, what this gamma 5 in this exponent is doing is it's, it's making u plus transform as e to the i alpha and u minus transform as e to the minus i alpha if, if we're in the chiral representation. But this has the advantage that it holds for any gamma matrices at all. Okay, so we get a new symmetry where you just put a gamma 5 in here. Again, this is only a symmetry, only a conserved current for, for massless fermions, not for mass itself. Okay, um, there's actually a beautiful story to do with this, this symmetry, which you'll come across maybe in the standard model or maybe in the next quantum field theory course. Th this is a symmetry of the classical theory and it doesn't survive to the quantum theory. So it's an example of what's called an anomaly. You think when you look at your equations that you have, you have a symmetry, but actually it's not there. And it's a wonderful, it's really one of the most beautiful things in, in quantum field theory. What, and it's all to do with these infinities and how you deal with the infinity. And, and basically what happens is that you know, you need to find a way to get rid of the infinities, but every way you can think of that gets rid of the infinities breaks this, this symmetry. It sort of has to introduce a mass somewhere along the line. And it's not recovered at the end of the day. Uh, and th th this is important. You know, this actually happens in, in nature. Nature would be very different if this symmetry existed um, than it is today. Yeah. But if things are massless and they're static mm -hmm. then why don't we still have that symmetry. Right, so, so this symmetry is there in the classical theory. But when you come to quantize, the symmetry in the classical theory doesn't survive through to the quantum theory. But, oh, so that even if m is zero, is that? Even if m is zero. Okay. Yeah, the symmetry is only there in the classical theory when m is zero. And the statement is that it's never there yeah. in the quantum theory. Uh, I see, I misunderstood your statement. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, please. If you have a new number of fermions, mm -hmm. then fermion number is not necessarily conserved. Yeah. So how does that 
But I mean, here we would still have the same symmetry. We would still have the same conserved Q. No, but the Majorana fermion is, um, is such that this is basically a real object. Okay. So 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 this, this and is. then, just like for a real scalar field, you can't do this symmetry. But there's actually another basis of gamma matrices in which you can just make psi real and then yeah. you put it a Majorana fermion. Um, Whereas it, it's a bit like the introduction to gamma phi. If you're in an arbitrary basis of gamma matrices, you have to work a bit harder to say what you mean by this being real. You can't just set it to be real. Other questions? Okay. I think this is one of the most boring lectures. Um, let, let, let me let me quickly uh, move on um, and tell you about the simple solutions to the Dirac equation. Okay, we would just want to solve this equation. Did Malcolm tell you about solutions to this equation? No? I, uh... Oh, by the way, one thing I told you, I, I didn't tell you, but Malcolm did. Th this equation sort of mixes up all the different components of psi here, because there's a gamma matrix just here. There's a way to act on the left here with basically I gamma mu D mu plus M. And if you do that, you find that each individual component of psi solves the Klein-Gordon equation. So I, th I think Malcolm did that calculation with you. Is that, is that right? Um, and you know, usually people say that that's the proof that this is a Lorentz invariant equation. I think that's even how Dirac uh, wrote down this equation to begin with. And I, I, don't, I don't think that's quite true. Of course, it is a Lorentz invariant equation, so it's hard to say what the proof is. But I think the proof is what we did of going through and showing that this transforms as a Lorentz vector, this is a Lorentz scalar, and, and so on. OK, so a couple of um, different solutions. One's called positive frequency, and one's called negative frequency. Okay, this is some full vector for spinner. Let me look for solutions which are of the form e to the i p dot x, where this is a particular fixed uh, for spinner, which is going to depend on which p I'm looking at. Okay. So, so the solution to the Dirac equation of, with this ansatz. the following. So what do I mean by this? P is the particular four momentum that, that is part of the ansatz of the solution. Okay. It'll turn out to be four momentum in when we quantize. And here you can sort of see it already because it's a Fourier transform. Okay. This is a four momentum. And it's dotted with these particular four two by two matrices. These are the sigma mu's that I described earlier. So P0 is dotted with the unit matrix. And then the PIs are dotted with the Pauli matrix. Okay. The same here, but there's that extra minus sign because these are sigma bars, not, not sigmas. The proof of this I'm just going to leave as an exercise for you to do this afternoon. You're going to have lots of exercises this afternoon just <coughs> playing around with gamma matrices and, and just getting used to that. Okay. But it should be clear. You take this, you put it in here, you plug the whole thing into here, and you show that... Um, 
that this solves the, the Dirac equation. Where are their squiggles? Oh, good, sorry. So, so <laughs> yeah, these, these, are, these are Greek letters called psi. And each one is a particular two-component complex spinner. Okay, and it can be any, anything you like. It has to be the same, but other than that, it's, it's anything you like. Um, so in fact, it, it's often useful to introduce a basis. Sorry, say again. If we're calling it U P, that would. Um, right. Yeah, it's just it's just a name. It's going to come up later in the course. It's a particular four-dimensional. Uh, it's a particular four spinner that takes this form that depends on P. Oh, by the way, P zero here is always taken to to be the square root of P squared plus M. The psi is any two-component spinner, and it's going to be useful later on to introduce a basis of two-component spinners. So I'm going to call them f equals 1 and 2. This isn't the spinner index. This is just telling me which particular spinner I'm interested in. And I just want them to solve the following equation, that, that it's, it's basically a basis, that their inner product with themselves is 1, and they're orthogonal to each other. Yeah. yeah. Do you know, I, I think we almost certainly have, right? Otherwise, yeah. Solution, yeah, in the chiral representation. Yeah, it, it, it has to be, otherwise there's not enough information there. So yeah, thanks, that, that's important. Okay, so here's just a simple example of a basis that you probably should have in mind when playing with this. Okay, so that's uh, two solutions to the Dirac equation. Two, because this is a two-component spinner here, and you know we have you can either have this guy or this guy. So the other solutions are the negative frequency solutions. And these take the form where you try and put a plus sign here instead of a minus sign. I, I should stress here that the reason that, that this isn't the same as this, where you just send p to minus p, is, is because is because p zero here is not something arbitrary. Right? It's fixed to be this on shell guy. I guess when you when you do this exercise, you'll you'll see that that's that's the case. Sorry, I should have should have stressed. Okay. 
okay, this afternoon you're going to do this exercise, you're going to do this exercise. These eaters are, again, two-component spinners, any two-component spinners, but the same one. Um, and you'll check that this indeed solves the Dirac equation. You'll also do a bunch of other exercises to do with when you take the inner product of one of these with itself, or one of these with one of these, or the outer product, or, and there's all sorts of identities that these, these guys satisfy. And you're going to just prove them all this afternoon because they're going to be useful later. Uh, Joe, you had a question? No? Oh, you sort of <laughs> stopped your hands up. And you, uh, Okay, any questions? Yeah. Um, but the negative frequency solutions, is P0 the negative square root? No, P0 is still the positive square root. Okay. So, sorry this is a bit muddled, and I keep remembering extra things to tell you. But I, would, I usually go through this on the board, but we just don't have time. Remember what I forgot to say. Okay, is this is this all clear? spinner, it depends on the value of, of three momentum p in kinetics. So that, that's really what this means. It's just telling you that it depends on p. And the reason it doesn't depend on p0 is basically because p0 is fixed. Okay, so, right. Yeah, that, that's also a, a spinner up there? No, good. So, so this is, uh, these are just the three numbers, and p0 is, is Okay. Uh, so this is just you know unusual e to the i p x, the same kind of e to the i p x we have at the scale. This is the fourth component object. And it's given by this. Okay. This in itself maybe takes an explanation because this is a two by two matrix, and then you take the square root of the two by two matrix, which basically means you need to find a matrix which squares to that two by two matrix, and then you act on this arbitrary three component. Okay. Yeah. It'll be clearer this afternoon when you actually sit down and show why this is the solution. But I need this notation for what's coming up. This U and this, this V are going to be important. Okay. Uh, other questions? I thought it was a square root. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> It's a V. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, it's, it's, it's supposed to be you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. You'll be pleased to know we're just facing into one lecture, something that took two lectures. Any, any questions about, about this? No, it's fairly straightforward, but I appreciate you probably just have to sit down and do the algebra to really, really see what's going on. Okay. okay, so now we're going to move on, and we're going to quantize this field. And what we're going to do is um, do exactly the same thing as we did for the scalar field, okay? Except that's going to be the wrong thing to do. Uh, but I want to sort of do the wrong thing, the naive thing, lead you through it, show you where it goes wrong, and then tell you how you rescue things, okay? So...
this is the action. The first thing to do is just think of this as a classical theory and figure out what the momentum is that's conjugate to psi. So the momentum is defined by the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to psi dot. Differentiate with respect to psi dot. There's the i, there's a gamma zero lurking in this d slash, and there's the psi, dot, psi bar. Okay, but psi bar gamma zero, we, know, we have a name for that. That's just psi dagger. Okay, so what, what to say here? For firstly, notice that the momentum it isn't proportional to something dot. So that this might be a little, a little unfamiliar. This follows immediately because we've got a first order equation of motion here rather than a second order equation of motion. Okay. What this means is, and this is a statement just within the classical theory, just theories of differential equations. For a classical field, if you want to know how it's going to evolve for all times in the future, you have to stipulate what the initial uh, data of the field is and what its initial velocity is. Okay, two initial conditions, second order differential equation, then you know what happens from then on. Here that's not true, that you need to specify the the correct statement is that you need to specify the field and its momentum, but we see now that the momentum is, is just the conjugate of the field. Okay. So the initial data you need to specify is psi as a complex field, as an initial slice, and then this first order equation takes you on from over from there. Okay. So we'll proceed as we did for the scalar field. And we'll see that this will actually be the wrong thing to do. OK, so what do we do for the scalar field? We have, we have a field, which is a function of space and time. And we have a momentum, which is a function of space and time. And what we did for the scalar field was we imposed canonical commutation relations between position and momentum, field and itself. Okay? We first are going to work in the Schrodinger picture instead of the Heisenberg picture. So now in the quantum theory, psi and pi become functions just of space and not of space-time. We'll, we'll go to the Heisenberg picture later. Okay. So impose canonical commutation relations. All of these are three vectors, and they're three vectors because we're in the Schrodinger picture. You could have these spinner indices up or down. It, it doesn't matter. We're not going to raise and lower them with any metric. Okay. Okay. So this will be our first guess. One small point. There's no factor of i here, and that's because there, there's an i inside the momentum, so it's just, just cancelled. Okay. It, it's going to be this very first step that 
we do, we do, we've done wrong already. But I'm just going to push through to show you why it's wrong. Okay. So we need a mode expansion. For these fields, uh, Psi. Again, just as we did for the scalar field, we expanded in terms of creation and annihilation operators. We'll do the same here. <laughs> Tell me. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. You want to just, uh, will you still call? <coughs> yeah. Okay, so the mode expansion is the same conceptual idea we had before, but it's just going to be a bit longer. It's going to be a bit longer precisely because we've got these spinner indices to play with. Okay, so what, what's, what's going on here? This is an operator, but there's an alpha index that I've suppressed. So really, it's four operators in a, in a spin. Okay, that's what this guy is. This is doing basically the mode expansion or Fourier transform of that operator. And yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so th this is familiar. This is familiar. These Bs and Cs are operators. And we've introduced two operators here and two operators here. Okay, different operators, B and C, just like for the complex field, not like for the real field. These guys here are spinners. So it's these that are soaking up the spinner index of this. And these are exactly the spinners that we've, that we've seen already. where the S index is the index on this basis for uh, P dot sigma, P dot sigma bar, Z to S. Okay, so the S index is the index on the basis for these two component objects, one zero and zero one, basically. Let's make sure I got the minus signs right there. You good? Okay. 
Okay, so this again is, a, is an operator, but it's a bunch of oper operators sort of as a conjugate vector, so going this way, and similarly these guys go this way, and these guys go this way, but these are just the operators. Okay, so, so by playing around with these S indices, we sort of absorbed the, we basically wrote down a basis of spinners, labeled that basis by S, well, by U and by V, and then by S, and then absorbed that, that S into the operator. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, good. So, so the these are these you know, the answer is yes. They sort of live in different spaces. Yeah, so yeah, we, this, we, don't, we don't really know much about those coefficients yet. So can we? The, this is just uh, it's, it's just a matrix. Uh, sorry, a vector of numbers. It hasn't been turned into an operator. It's the coefficients here that are turned into operators. Right. So these are operators, but these aren't. They're just the same things we have. What, what do the operators B and C have to pawn? It's the same issue that we had in the scalar field theory. We're going to construct a pop space. Uh, and that's the okay, thing. so they have to yeah, They're going to be, again, creation and annihilation operators. Okay. For objects in a pop space. Questions? No, is the notation clear? The notation not clear. Sorry. Eric, you almost raised your hand. <laughs> um, I just was going to ask this, when these Bs and, and Cs operate, um, do we operate them as uh, two component uh, operators, or or do we operate them independently like that? So there's, there's, there's two Bs, B1 and B2. And you could just think of them as two different creation and annihilation. And the same for the seeds. So do we use them independently, or do we always have to use No, we use them independently. You, you have the vacuum you can activate either with B1 or with B2. The interpretation is going to be that these are creating a particle that spin up. Okay, that's what, that's what we're getting. Other questions? Good. Let, let me just tell you what goes wrong with, with this theory. So, we do the same thing we did before. We have commutation relations between these, and they imply commutation relations between these and these. for you guys, and you're, you're used to these exercises now, right? You know, just plug it in, do Fourier transforms, and then commutations, and then Fourier transforms, and then commutations, and then out. Um, there's a minus. Okay. Nothing wrong with it at the moment, but it's different from the beats, and it's different from what we have for this game. There's a minus. You know, you might think, that's okay, we'll just re redefine C and C. There's a minus. What's the next? The next step that we did was to look at the Hamiltonian. By the way, when you do this, this exercise, you'll need to know some of the cute properties of those U's and V's, and you'll figure out those cute properties and so on. There's things like tweeting under the line. Okay, 
nothing different about the Hamiltonian. This Classically, um, you plug in the definition of the momentum, which is just psi dagger. Notice that the time derivative disappears completely from the Hamiltonian. Okay. This, this is something that happens whenever you have first order equations of motion. <coughs> because this is pi of psi dot, but when you take off what's here, there's already a pi of psi dot. So when you get to something remote, it doesn't depend on time derivatives. Again, these kind of tedious things where you've got uh, h in terms of some fields, but you now plug in the operator expressions for the fields, and you put h's as an operator. <coughs> this is just right here. The actual handle to you. Of course, that's the integral of the handle to the density. This is the Hamiltonian. There's a sum over S equals 1 and 2. So you sum over the All the creation of annihilation operators. Uh, there's two for B and there's two for C. <coughs> and the problem is that there's a minus sign. Just here. I know it sounds stupid, but why is that a problem? This is a problem for the following reason. This, this theory doesn't make any sense because it has no stable ground state. You define a vacuum which is annihilated by B and C, but then if you act on it with C dagger, you're going to find a state with, with lower energy because of this. And you can keep going and keep going. Now, we've come across infinite energies before, so you might think, well, there's that normal ordering coefficient, maybe I can help make that work for me. You, you might think that you, know, you, you can go back to the original definitions of Cs and try and change them. And, but the, this minor sign is like a bubble in all people. No matter how you try to fix it, if you change something, it just it reappears. This minor sign is a real one. I wasn't bad. I just didn't quite see this. <laughs> There's no way to make sense of spinner fields quantized in this way. <coughs> so if you, if you start with those initial commutation relations between psi and psi dagger, you'll always screw up. You'll never get a sense of it. Yeah. 
Is this at all related to the idea of like a sea of particles and antiparticles that have like infinitely low energies and then to get a particle you, you sort of just pop one out? Right, so, so, so Dirac found something very similar in his interpretation of the Dirac equation. Um, that, that interpretation is, is not, that interpretation that Dirac postulated was treating psi as a wave function for a single particle. And that's definitely not the case. So, so yes, it's the same sort of idea. I think in the next lecture, we'll, we'll see the resolutions of this. And I, I may also just um, sort of compare and contrast with Dirac's, Dirac's picture. Um, let, let, let me just finish this, the sentence here, and then, then I'll come back to you. So we can't make sense of spinner fields quantized in this way. And what we've got to change is that we've got to treat them as fermions. And that means going right back to those commutation relations we started with and writing down something a little bit different. Um, and we'll see exactly what it is uh, in the next lecture. But, but what you're seeing here is the first glimpse uh, of what's called the spin statistics theorem in, in quantum field theory. You know that, that half integer objects are fermions and integer objects, integer spin objects are, are bosons. Um, what we're seeing is if you try to take a half integer spin object, the spinner, and quantize it as a boson, you don't get anything sensible. And the only way we're going to get anything sensible, for example, having energies that are bounded below, is to quantize it as a fermion, which we'll do in the next lecture. Eric, you had a question? Oh, yeah. So when, when Dirac did all this, did, did he know about spinners? He sort of invented them. <laughs> well, when, but when he postulated the, the Dirac equation, Okay. Yeah. That was fine. That was easy. Yeah. Other questions? Sorry, also on a historical point. Did he, um, did he know about fermions? I mean, did he know did we get to fermions before we got to the Dirac equation, and then he said, oh, well, this, he saw this, and then said, oh, well, this must be a fermion law, which we're on. His, his solution to this was that there was an unbounded uh, spectrum, and he said, but they're fermions, which is something extra you have to throw in by hand. And then he says, well, they're all filled up and all these things are filled up. And we start there. That's, that, that's not really the right interpretation. It's a very useful interpretation, especially as it, it's exactly the right interpretation in condensed matter physics where you talk about the Fermi scene instead of the Dirac scene. Um, but but it, it really comes from thinking of the Dirac equation, the psi being the wave function for a single particle. That, that's where you, you run into the and, and that's not, not really and I'll try and elaborate on this. So that's, that's just the number operator, pretty much, right? The yeah. Visa. So it's just the difference in, in particle minus any particle. That, that's, what it, that's what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's not, it's, it's the energy of the universe. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but can the energy of the universe just be the difference between particles and any particles? Like, but, but then you you can each other out. You uh oh, but you can still just keep making it. Start tumbling down. Yeah. Right. And you eventually get many energies. Yeah. What if antiparticles have negative energy? Well yeah, that's then then that would be a theory that was unstable. You would just so, yeah, keep, that's, keep creating you still just add a bunch of tiny particles. This is basically this is, yeah. this is energy. Okay. But this is safe. Um, and the theory doesn't make sense. And it makes sense on the free level because basically on the free level you put particles there and then they <coughs> So it's only when we come to consider interactions that every interaction will start creating as many antiparticles. So it will be radically incompetent. Other, other questions? Okay, let's do coffee. <laughs>